everybody. Welcome to The Oldish. I'm your host, Karen Brown. I'm the publisher and editor of The Oldish, and today we're going to be answering some questions from our viewers. How about that? We've got questions around um, how to live a more independent life, why they should use our medication checklist, and some recommendations on Facebook communities for people who are caregivers, among others. So stay tuned for all of that. So let's start off with a question from Scott from Ohio. Thanks, Scott. He wants to know why the heck you should use our medication checklist. Well, Scott, you don't have to use our medication checklist, but you should use a medication checklist. Now, if you choose to use ours, it is available at no cost, and it is available through a free membership at theoldish.com. You just create an account, doesn't cost you anything, but the information that goes into that medication checklist, it's nobody's business but yours. We can't even see it. Our medication checklist was reviewed by an ER doctor who said, I wish all of my patients came into the ER with a checklist like this. So it's important to have a medication checklist of some kind. What is really important for you to understand is that medications aren't just prescriptions. Your doctor may give you prescriptions, but you may buy things off the shelf at the drugstore or the grocery store for a headache, a stomach and acid. You may enjoy a cup of herbal tea in the afternoon. Everything that you put in your mouth interacts with everything else you put in your mouth. It's basic chemistry, and your doctor needs to know what you're taking. Now, I'm sure he doesn't care about that peanut butter sandwich you ate, but he does care if you're taking an antacid regularly because it may have a negative interaction with some prescription medications that you're taking, and all of that stuff needs to be available to them. More importantly, if you end up at the ER, and let's say you're unconscious, the doctors who are treating you are going to want to know what medications you're on. Clearly, you can't tell them if you're unconscious, but your medication checklist can. If you had emailed that medication checklist to your doctor, if your wife, husband, partner, adult child has access to that medication checklist, they can provide it. Even if you are conscious, you are likely to be very frazzled in those moments in the ER, and it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to remember the names of all of your medications, how much of them you're taking, how often you're taking them. If you have a properly laid out medication checklist, all of that information will be there, along with the name of your family physician, the pharmacy where you got your medications, your blood type, your next of kin. There's a whole lot of information that can go on one sheet of paper. So whether you use our checklist or not, you should use a checklist. Mary from London, England asks how the oldish came to be because she enjoys our content so much. Thank you, Mary. That's very kind of you to say. And uh, we actually have a lot of viewers in the UK. So the oldish grew out of experiences that I have had over the course of 20 some odd years working with aging seniors. Um, we first started work as a uh, a catalog of assistive devices that we sold all over the world. And we still have some of those assistive devices for sale in our online store, which is called Brown Healthcare. So there's my conflict of interest here. I do have an online store and we sometimes do refer people to that, but as always, there are always competitors and you should check everything out. Anyway, back to Helpmates. A couple of years into that process, we were offered a Canadian distributorship for hip saver hip protectors. Who knew that they were going to become the number one hip protector in the world? At the time, we didn't. Um, we knew that it was a competitive entry into a market that wasn't particularly big and that it was a very needed product. So the growth was slow, but within a couple of years, it had taken over everything. And we didn't really have a lot of time to do the assistive devices anymore. When we were dealing with families who had loved ones who had fallen and had fractured a hip and had ended up in long-term care, or maybe they were able to go home, but they needed some help and some services and devices. We ultimately found that they were very frazzled and frustrated. And our conversations went far beyond hip protectors. They would just express their, their concerns and their frustrations to myself and to my staff quite freely. And we got used to, to listening to that. That led to the creation of a blog called MyParentsAreOld.com. So it was uh, a place where we could 
put these kinds of questions, perhaps do a little research, allow the community to um, answer other people and one another with their experiences, with things that they had found. Despite the fact that our country is very broad, healthcare is a very small community and it, it wasn't difficult for these people to find one another. A few years went by and we found that the, that blog was being very well used, but also a lot of aging seniors themselves were participating in this. So on a business trip out west, I scheduled a meeting with Dr. Fabio Feldman, who has a 20 some odd year history in fall and injury prevention. We also connected with Dr. Vicki Scott, who has a much longer history in dealing with aging seniors. And we discussed the possibility of transitioning myparentsareold.com to something else. And it didn't take long for us all to agree that it needed to be something else. And what came out of that was the oldish. So my web team and I got busy and created the oldish. It's intended as a place where greater discussion, discussion can take place on a number of issues. At the same time, allow us to uh, approach a number of social platforms where people can engage and discuss. We can do things like this Facebook Live and people can have conversations around the content that we're putting out there. So we've got a number of things coming up this year, by the way. We're getting into some ebooks and some e-courses based on comments that we've had from readers and the kind of engagement that we've had around specific issues on this website. So we continue to grow and evolve and we welcome you to join us on that journey. Thanks for that question, Mary. Jennifer from Texas <laughs> sent a compliment on my nails. Who knew? You're looking at my nails. Well, Jennifer, I'll tell you, I don't have time to go and get my nails done at a nail salon. There are, I live in a small town and there are like five different places where I can go and get my nails done. I have had my nails done, um, the gel put on when my daughters got married. And I didn't like it because they, they would file down the top of my nails and then it would take like four months for my nails to come back to a healthy state. So I, I didn't like doing that. If I polish them myself, you know, it's all chipped off by the next day. I'm not very precious about my nails, but I have a friend in the States who has this side gig called Color Street. And she told me about these nail strips. They are actually nail strips that um, that go on. They, they come in um, two strips of eight each and they're varying lengths and sizes so you choose the one that goes on your nail. In 15 minutes my nails are done. It's super simple and it lasts about 10 days. So that's great. I'm sorry to my viewers in Canada, it's not available there yet, but my understanding is that Color Street is coming to Canada. To our viewers in Europe, the UK, Australia, I'm sorry, I have no idea what their plans are for that. But that is my solution to nails. And thank you for noticing, Jennifer. Who knew? Michael from Nice, France wants to know if I do any speaking at conferences. Thank you for the question, Michael. And yes, I do. I get asked to do uh, public speaking from time to time. And if you're having a conference in France, you let me know because I love France and I will be there in a heartbeat. Okay? That's great. Brenda from Halifax, Nova Scotia. She wants to have some recommendations for Facebook community she can connect with as a caregiver and she doesn't have the chance to get out much. Now this is a question I've had in private messages as well. So thank you for this Brenda and uh, because I've had it asked so many times I'm including your question in this and first of all I want to give you kudos for understanding that self-care is really important when you're a caregiver. It is truly one of the most important things and one of the most neglected things. So there are a couple of communities that I participate in um, and that I recommend to others, but you check them out and see what you think. One group where I see a lot of good discussion happening is called Molly's Movement. So that's a group on Facebook called Molly's Movement. It is an open group, so you do have to be cautious about what you say. An open group on Facebook is one where anybody can see the members and anybody can see the conversation that's taking place. So you do have to ask to join the group, but it is public. So be careful about that, but it, it really does have some awfully good content and I strongly advise you to check that out. Another group that I recommend is called Life with Alzheimer's and it's a closed group. 
So you have to request to join. It's a closed group, so people can't see what the discussion is. But of course, as always, you don't know who the other members are, so I always advise caution around providing too much personal information on any of these. But the content that is in both of these groups, I have found to be of tremendous value. So highly recommend them. Your local chapter of the Alzheimer's Association may have some local groups that you can check out as well. Some of them may be online, some of them may be group meetings. I'm not sure, every chapter does their own thing. So I highly suggest that you check that out. Margaret from San Diego, California wrote to say that she is upset by the one size fits all approach that her mother experiences in her care facility. She wasn't really asking a question, she was just expressing a frustration. And yes, that's why we're here. Margaret, you raise a concern that is shared by many. Care facilities, especially the larger ones, are often talked about and written about as little more than warehouses for aging seniors, where the residents are made to adhere to rigid schedules that really suit the staff and the processes of the facility a whole lot more than they suit the residents for whom that is home. Um, I don't have any broad solutions for you. I, I really don't. Um, but, you know, I think when meals are served at static times and baths happen on a schedule and people have to go to bed at a certain time and wake up at a certain time, I'm not sure that that's what any of us have in mind after we've worked long and hard throughout our lives. You know, it's far better um, to be in a situation where if we don't want to have breakfast until 10 o'clock, we can. We can have a shower every day if that's our habit. I understand from a corporate perspective how batching chores can be very efficient from a personnel point of view and from a financial efficiency point of view. But these aren't objects we're dealing with. They are real people and they matter a whole lot more than processes. I'm not sure what the solution really is. I have seen some smaller facilities where the norm is a more personal environment where people can sleep in, where they have more privacy, where they can have guests, where there is maybe a bar and they can have a drink, where they can have a shower every day or every other day, whatever they want. Um, but I think that there is enormous opportunity for discussion around this sort of issue. Every facility has a residence advisory council and I urge you to have these discussions there and see if you can push things forward a little bit more every time to make it a more home-like environment. I urge you to advocate in your community as well because community discussions are important, particularly if the care facilities that you are dealing with are funded by a government level of any kind. So thank you for writing in. It's a really interesting discussion and it's one that, it's one with no easy solution but it is one that we absolutely should be talking about. Jennifer from Perth, Australia wants to know how she can stay independent for as long as possible because she doesn't want to go to a care facility unless absolutely necessary. Jennifer, I think that's a goal for all of us. We want to stay in our own homes for as long as we possibly can. Um, part of the solution is definitely taking control of things that you can take control of, being proactive and advocating for yourself even advocating for yourself with yourself if need be. You know that exercise that you don't normally want to do? You've got to advocate for yourself in your brain and, and talk yourself into doing it because it's the right thing to do and it's good for you. I urge you to be open-minded about solutions because some of, the, some of the solutions mean compromising. And compromise means change. Change is not something that human beings do easily or often willingly. So I do urge you to make some thinking. You know, for instance, make a plan for what happens when you need to stop driving. That day is going to come for all of us, folks. Every single one of us is going to have um, the experience of having to stop driving, either because the doctor takes our license away or because our adult children say, you know, mom, the driving thing, you're not so good at it anymore. Or maybe because there's an accident, something happens. And you definitely don't want to be in a position where you have the potential to harm somebody else. If your drive for independence is a little higher than your 
your regard for others, that may be a problem, but here's where you can support your own independence and make a plan. So if you need to stop driving, think about what the alternatives are going to be from where you live. Are you on or near a, a transit route of any kind? If not, what is on a transit route? Is there, is there housing that is appropriate on a transit route? And yes, the compromise here is that you're going to move away from the family home. What's more important to you? Staying in the family home and becoming dependent on other people or becoming socially isolated or moving to a place where you can go where you want, when you want. That's the compromise plan, you know? Um, I have said on this show before that I had a friend, she has passed now, several years ago she passed, and she lived in a major city in an apartment building. The apartment was great for her, but she needed people to take her to doctor's appointments, to take her to the grocery store, to take her to the pharmacy. She needed people to basically do everything for her. That's not independence. That's just moving the long-term care facility to one single spot. And sooner or later, your friends will get tired of being that person of always having to be there for you in case. And that's not a situation that I think any of us really wants. And it can start out as, hey Mary, do you want me to take you to the grocery store on Wednesday? I'm going anyway. And within two months, you're calling them saying, I need to go to the grocery store, can you come and get me? And it may not be convenient for their life. You know, chances are it's somebody who's younger, who may be a working person, who may be raising children. You know, you get the message. You don't want to become that person who is dependent on everybody else around you. Take control of your own life and look at those options. If it means you have to make compromises, then it does. I think independence is something worth compromising for. Um, so m make a list of things that will impact you as you age. Grocery shopping is a good one. So we, we talked about driving. Grocery shopping we just mentioned. In my community, I can shop online for my groceries at my favorite local store. I can build a shopping list. I can just pop on when I decide that I need this, this, and this. I can sit down in one go and make a shopping list. I can submit the order, pay for it with my credit card, tell them what day and what two hour window I'm going to show up. And when I pull into the parking lot, I send them a text and they will come out with my groceries and load them into my car. So if I was not driving, this is where I could perhaps hire a taxi or I could hire some other service. Maybe the grocery store will eventually have a delivery service for such things as the number of aging seniors in our community increases. I don't know, but buying your groceries online and you know preventing the need to walk the aisles of the grocery store can be a really big deal for some aging seniors and I encourage you to check that out. Um, it's a legitimate solution. Socialization is important as well, so that's something that you want to make sure is on your list. Okay, so you want to you want to have things on your list like driving, socialization, grocery store, doctor's visits. You know, what are your options? And maybe all of the options aren't going to turn out to be the option for you. But if you at least start thinking about how to remain independent, and if you have that thought before your window of opportunity closes, so. This is something we've talked about before on this show. We all have this window of opportunity during which we can make decisions for ourselves. If something happens, like we fall and break a hip, and we are no longer able to live independently, maybe we have to live in a care facility, or maybe we have to have someone come in and help us with the activities of daily living, that takes away independence from us. If we had made some other decisions just before that fall happened, we may not be in that, that boat of being less independent. So we all have this window and you need to make those choices before the, the window slams shut on those opportunities. So Jennifer, that's, that's what you do. You, you make a list of things that are going to support your independence and you make a list of options for each one and you reason with yourself about the compromises. Very simple. 
Brian from Toronto wants to know if readers can suggest articles uh, or ideas for articles for the oldish. Absolutely. We love to hear what you're, what you're thinking about, what your needs are, what your frustrations are. You can uh, reach us one of two ways, info at theoldish.com or on our website at theoldish.com. We have a contact form and you can fill that out and send it to us and we would be happy to look at that. Um, we get a lot of um, unsolicited articles from people that are promoting their own products and services and we tend not to do that basically because we don't really know who these people are or what these products are and if I don't know what a product is I won't recommend it to you. Uh, if I don't know what a service is I won't recommend it to you but uh, from our readers and viewers absolutely if there's something on your mind let us know. Last but not least, I've had a few questions about what my qualifications are to do this. And people have been very nice about it. Nobody's been accusatory, so don't think that. But, um, I, so I am not an OT, a PT, an RN, a doctor, a social worker. I am none of those things. I have a Bachelor of Science in Anthropology, which is the study of mankind. And so I've always been interested in how human beings live their lives and develop. I have over 20 years of experience in dealing with aging seniors in particular. And that is really, you know, my expertise, such as it is, is basically from being on the ground, talking to you, listening to you, problem solving with you. Um, you know, the good news about that is that I, I have not been educated in a specific way to that has trained me to think in a specific way and solve problems in a specific way. The bad news is I haven't been trained in a specific way, I suppose. There, there's a good side and a bad side to all of that. Um, I actually have been talking with uh, a university about doing some, doing a master's degree and I even have a project to work on. They're having a bit of a problem because they, they like my project. The problem is finding somebody who can supervise me because when you do a master's degree, you have to have a supervisor. The problem is that academics at universities are experts very deeply in one little slice of something. And my project and my knowledge is far more broad-based than that. So they have to find somebody to supervise me who has this much knowledge, and they don't. Everybody wants to be on my advisory uh, committee, but there's no one person who has the ability to supervise me because of my breadth of knowledge. Um, I tend to think horizontally and low to the ground, which is to say that I don't, I don't love bureaucracies. I don't do well in bureaucracies. Um, and I, I'm not somebody who gets caught up in the, the babble speak of whatever the silo is. I don't get trapped in silos either. So I think that's a good thing in dealing with older adults because I can look at things um, from a very basic perspective and I can analyze several different streams of thought at one time instead of um, tending to go just one way. That's my expertise, such as it is. Uh, really, it's, it's over 20 years of on-the-ground experience. That's the reality. So that is what has birthed the oldish, and that is what I'm using to go forward. If the university can find me a supervisor, I may get some increased academic uh, credentials. I'm not sure how much difference it will make to you or to the projects that we want to take on, but I certainly always want to be somebody that you view as credible and somebody whose word you can trust and who is transparent to you. So I'll do my best to do that and be that for you. So here's what I will ask of you, is that you like and follow us on Facebook, that you join us every week for our Facebook Lives, and that you share them when you think that they are of value to your friends. I also invite you to join us at theoldish.com where we publish new content pretty much every day. It's about six days a week our writer publishes articles for you across a wide range of content and um, I think that most of you will find it immensely interesting. We have almost 1400 articles there now so there is going to be something for everybody and it's amazing when I look at the data every week about how many readers we have and the articles that they're looking at it amazes even me 
but it also does my heart good because it tells me we're on the right track. So people, I invite you to join us next Wednesday at 12 noon for the oldish. And until then, be well, and please do remember that it takes a village to age a senior.